What we'll talk about, though, in this session are the current state of assessment protocols that the customer base is using today and establishing a balance between assessing those suppliers that you have and your application in which you're using these components. And that will allow you to develop a continuum by counterfeit risk by plotting an intersection of these two, the supplier risk and the application itself, to give you a model for counterfeit risk assessment that you can use in your company. And we'll take some pragmatic considerations for that model as well. So the topic in and of itself is the current state of counterfeit risk mitigation assessment and protocols. I have done some work since I originally worked on this, and I did a little bit more statistical analysis of some documents that we have received. We have a large number of customers, and I believe we get a fairly good swath of the industry by looking at the documents we've received. And I looked at 53 different documents in the past three and a half years related to counterfeit risk assessments and began to categorize these to evaluate exactly how detailed are these requests and requirements being passed on to us in the flow downs, and how are they being passed on, and what is the methodology that's being used. And that will make a little bit more sense as I show you the results. Most customers are approaching this issue with their supply base through the use of a clause that is attached to a purchase order or a policy. And those policies either come with acknowledgment or just a policy they promulgate, which you may or may not acknowledge, so it really has no contractual validity. It's nice to know. Looking at those two together, two-thirds of the customers are approaching it in that way. There are about a third of the customers, though, that are doing a survey, trying to get an understanding of where their suppliers are in the maturity of their counterfeit risk processes and protocols. So there's a distinction between I'm going to tell you what I want you to do versus I want to see what you're doing. Two-thirds of the people are telling the suppliers what to do, and a third are asking what are you doing, roughly. This is an example of a clause, one of multiple pages from a defense contractor. It does. You'll notice many of them will utilize the terms that we saw from Section 818. This one does. It specifies a preference for the OCM or their authorized distributor. The survey itself can range from a page to a few pages where you have a yes, no, generally a yes or no. Are you doing X or Y? So you don't have much of a range of how developed or mature the system is, but from that you can have the ability to make a generalized understanding of is my supplier taking this seriously at all, and I can have a general risk. I have seen one in great detail which actually gives a score, but of all the surveys that I've looked at, only one gave a score. The others were yes or no answers for which the recipient would have to make a judgment of their own in terms of is this supplier low risk or high risk. Only one had a built-in scored model. There are other protocols, of course. You can have a fellow like this show up at your door. For those of us who get audited from time to time, we get people who hopefully are happier than this guy is when they arrive. And we have a few that kind of say, well, we want you to be certified to what, OAS 5553 or 681 or 1010, IDEA standard 1010, of which only one of those has the ability to be certified at the moment. So somebody kind of picks something and just hopes that that will work. Those certification protocols are being worked on, as you heard about this morning. We're heading in that direction, but it's not there yet. So moving forward and talking about then how is it that we can look at our supply base and determine is this a high risk supplier or not? Well, Google Earth helps a lot. There's no doubt about it. It's one of the best things that ever happened to not only supplier but customer 
evaluation. When you can look it up and see what that address is and find out that it is a pack and mail or a UPS box or is it a nice facility. You can't go by the websites alone because there have been counterfeiters that have a beautiful picture of somebody else's building on their website. But even once you have suppliers of the same type, there is, of course, a wide variety of capabilities. In this case, you have a machine lathe milling down a piece of steel, or you could use a CNC machine, both of which could produce the product you need. The company that uses a CNC machine would think probably has far greater sets of procedures. It's a much greater investment to have a machine such as that. But the reality is they all have tradeoffs. And you can get something faster. The setup time for a CNC machine could be five times that that it took to mill and lathe that part, depending on how complicated it is. So you have to have that tradeoff as a customer thinking about what is it that I need done. Does it make sense to go to the very best supplier in terms of all the protocols and procedures when all I really need is some new packaging material, let's say? So there is a tradeoff here between good, cheap, and fast. You can always pick only two. And the third is what you won't usually be able to get. So you have a tradeoff on your supplier side, but you also have a tradeoff on your application itself. And this is where your knowledge of what you're making really comes into play. And it's hard. I'll guarantee you it is hard as a person who once bought components themselves. Sometimes it's hard to understand exactly what you're buying. And it's embarrassing to be somebody buying a part number and knowing nothing about it. It's embarrassing to go back to an engineer to ask him to learn something about it because you don't know anything and the engineer doesn't want to take the time to explain it to you. Just buy the part number I spec'd in. So there's a lot of internal conflicts that make it hard for a buyer. What we do know, and we ought to know and we ought to learn, what it is that we're making. If I'm building a singing birthday card, the risk of a counterfeit component there is much less than if I'm building a missile. When you're looking within your own application, and Henry alluded to this earlier, you do have to think about what is this application? What is it being used for? Do I need to have the same risk protocols for an extra feature as I do for a core feature or for one that will cause an irreparable harm should it fail versus maybe my radio won't work? Those types of thoughts. So we have to think about what does the part do in my system and is this critical? And then we get into questions of ADLs. And this is where it gets very, very difficult for the defense industry because we have vehicles and systems that are in use much longer than they were designed for. The American B-52 is on about its 50th year and we're still using it. So we know things that were designed 50 years ago were never thought to be used 50 years later. The continuing engineering resources that were funded when that plane was developed aren't available today. And so ADLs become inflexible, not necessarily because the design can't accommodate another part, but because I don't have the funding to pay for an engineer to spend any time on it. Or because I don't have the engineering staff because my engineering staff is working on a new product. I don't have time to go back and look at something we designed 10, 15 years ago. But I will, my experience has been that quite often the ADL can be flexible. I have sold motor start capacitors in the past and these are the ones that look like a Coke can, big ones. And for example, every refrigerator has a motor start capacitor in it. So everybody here has one at their home. And if it's 10,000 microfarad, it will start that refrigerant, the motor. It will also start at 11,000 or 12,000 microfarad. And you know what? You'll probably never know the difference. That doesn't mean there aren't capacitances in certain circuits that are absolutely critical but would be very, very tight. But there are also others where close enough 
it's frankly good enough. So that flexibility comes into play, and that's something that we have to think about as a producing entity. How flexible can I be? So when I put these things together, if I know my supplier, what are their capabilities, what are their processes, and I know my application, I can make a much better decision weighing those two risks and putting them together. So if we look at evaluating our suppliers then, how do I make a continuum of suppliers? I can go from one end where I can buy something off of eBay, I have no idea who the guy is, or I can go to Alibaba, boy, I really have no idea who that is, to a supplier that I've been to and audited and I've been working with for 20 years and I've audited him multiple times. So you have that continuum there. So we have to ask, what do we use to decide how much time I spend? Do I put every single supplier I have through the same level of evaluation? And then it helps us to think about how critical our purchase is. And also, how easy is it for me to tell if it's a good component or not? There are some components that you can easily tell if it's been tampered with and some that you can't. That has to be something to think about. Who is the supplier? Meaning, if I'm buying directly from the UOCM, I probably don't need the level of scrutiny that I do if I buy from someone I don't know. They're the people that make the part. And this is where it gets fishy and where these ideas of what is trusted supplier, what does that mean, or what is an authorized source? This has come up a lot as we start to learn that an authorized source is not just an authorized distributor. We're very, very creative in North America and we find lots of ways to make money. And so the definition of what we think authorized source is gets diluted. And frankly, some people have become creative in using terms like authorized source because it has the word authorized in it to make somebody upstream think that that's the same as authorized distributor and they can check off a box. Even going so far as to persuading the OCM to issue a letter saying they're an authorized source and in fact they have no contract whatsoever. So that term gets hard. So let's step back a little bit and take a look at how this occurs. I don't want to assume that we all know how counterfeits occur. Certainly many in this room are far past that point. But for those who are not, this may be one of the first events you get to come to, I'll take a quick step of how this happens. An event will happen in the supply chain for the types of products that our company represents. It's generally a disruption such as a tsunami, which disrupted aluminum electrolytic supply for capacitors. Not in my product set, but in our competitors' product sets, DRAMs became a problem. Not just about the same time when Thailand had floods. So this event will cause a constriction of the supply. And we often talk about obsolescence causing an opportunity for counterfeits. That's true, but any supply constriction will cause it. It's provided it lasts long enough, it'll give them time to tool up and make the counterfeits available on the market. That results then in the customer that can't get any parts. Now what we hope happens is they go through a point of redesign. And they work with a supplier that they can trust who helps them come up with a product that will do the job safely and without risk, and they can continue on their way. Unfortunately, because of these other elements we've talked about, where you can't get the engineer's attention or time or funding to look at an alternative part, you may have to go to the independent distribution market. And there are good ones, and there are not good ones. If your local entrusted broker or untrusted broker doesn't have a product, he'll go out and search everyone he knows. They're very good at networking, that's how they live. And occasionally that goes back to sources where the product didn't come just necessarily from somebody's excess. It comes off of previously used boards, taken off with any number of methodologies, few of which are safe for the person doing it or for the part itself. And that's when this event occurs. Okay. 
So you have a risk, you have a continuum there of risk based upon the supplier. And I'm going to characterize this in generality. In generality, the independent distributor is your most risky source, through directly from the OCM themselves as the least risky. Of course, you can make it yourself and be even less risky. But let's make sure we understand some definitions, because one thing we have learned from our customer base through the last few years is customers don't always know what an independent distributor is or an authorized distributor. They can often lump them together. An independent distributor is a company that buys from the open market. That means it comes from excess inventory that a contract manufacturer or an OEM has. Sometimes if you see pictures of the boards that are stacked up in Guangdong province to be depopulated, you'll notice there's a whole big stack of exactly the same board. It's probably not a coincidence that everybody recycled their same model PC at the same time. No. This came from somebody's excess. They just dumped them on the market. Occasionally, you do a good job. You think you're recycling safely, and a recycler sends it back to China to be depopulated. The independent distributor can buy directly from an OCM. That is possible. They'll do a better job of finding the valid source than you did. They can buy from other distributors, authorized or independent. Normally, these distributors do not have a contract with the supplier other than the purchase order itself. They don't have an obligation other than to get the product in and get it to you. There's no rights or support or warranty that come with it other than their own. So if you were to buy from it, it's already been alluded to, if you were to buy a product from an independent distributor and you have an issue with it in terms of authenticity, the manufacturer will typically ask where you got it, and if it wasn't from themselves or the authorized chain, they're done. They'll only support that channel. So the authorized franchise distributor generally buys their product from the OCM himself, the company that makes it, the original component to the manufacturer. And they have contractual obligations beyond just offering it for sale. They do have to market it. They have to act on behalf of the supplier as a selling agent. They do design work with engineers. They do service the traditional role of selling small quantities and provide credit. And in return for these obligations, they have benefits that they make available to the wider market, which is one, warranty support. If you have a problem, that authorized distributor will help you warranty the material and provide engineering support, not only from their own resources but from the manufacturers themselves. They'll work hand-in-hand with engineering support. Now, the OCM, it gets difficult. You think you know what that means, too. We're finding we don't exactly know what that means either. As that gets more, a longer chain, you have original design manufacturers. You have people who design product but don't make it. Who is really the OCM here? Especially if you made it for a while and then you subcontracted it to somebody else. Generally, the OCM is the one who holds intellectual property rights, generally. They generally market under their own name. Even if you contracted somebody else, think about, I think we all know Apple, right? Apple doesn't make those parts. Foxconn makes everything, right? Well, if we have a problem, we don't usually call Foxconn. They're not going to do anything for us. You go back to Apple. The same approach is here. They offer those warranty rights. The difficulty, of course, and why other people have to, you don't always go directly to the OCM, is that there's generally a high minimum or a long lead time. And you have to remember that they, too, take customer returns. So if you're looking for a hole in the chain where a possible counterfeit could come back in, the return cycle is true for anyone in the chain. So a little bit of additional perspective. There are some realities about components. Active devices are the most often counterfeited product. Makes sense. If you're going to counterfeit electronic, let's counterfeit the ones that are worth the most money. Don't counterfeit $20 bills. Don't counterfeit $1 bills when you can counterfeit 20s or 100s. That doesn't mean that other products are not counterfeited. Many passive devices are not marked at all. It's pretty easy, then, just to make a new label. And it's amazing how often counterfeit passes are found because it has exactly the same lot and date code on every single one you ever get because somebody pulled that reel out of the dumpster behind Foxconn or whatever other location where they found the reel. So 
know that there is a reality of what's more commonly counterfeited, but that it's not the only thing that's counterfeited. Interconnects become less risky. If you move down the chain and you look at the types of products with very few customers, you're going to have lower risk. Because a counterfeiter has only, if there's only one customer using the part, that's the only one that's ever going to want it. The counterfeiter's got to hope that one day that guy's going to need it. They're probably going to go after the types of products that are used by many customers, so you have more opportunities to sell it. Geography does make a difference. The studies have shown that most of these counterfeits do come from Asia. Counterfeiters do get smarter, though. Because we know that, they also try to start routing them through some of the more trusted countries, through Europe, for example. And although there are some recent U.S. convictions, that does not mean that the United States rivals Asia in terms of the number of counterfeiters. It means that that's where the U.S. government has some authority to do something about it. As you look through the development of 818, one of the more disappointing things to me was the lack of involvement of the State Department or a realization that that dog won't hunt, as we say in Texas. There's not a lot you're going to be able to do to an Asian counterfeiter who up and moves every month or so anyway, which is to a large degree why the prime contractors are held on the hook, because they can be found, and they have deep pockets, so the government thinks. But I'm editorializing. Excuse me. Back to the presentation. So looking at these things together and thinking about some of these other qualifications, you can start to wonder how you can manage this by applying some perspective. How risky is the part itself? Is it a commonly counterfeited product or not? How risky is the supplier? What type of supplier do I have in the supply chain? And suggest a workable scale for those. Plot these intersections and apply a level of protocol that is appropriate for you. So if we look at this continuum we started with before, you can start to break it down by looking at the types of suppliers, and then a little bit within that. So if I'm going to buy, if I need to buy from an independent distributor, I really want to know where did that part come from, and that's why traceability has become so important. If the part came from a North American source, you generally have lower risk. It doesn't mean you have no risk, but generally lower. If it came from an authorized distributor, you want to make sure that that authorized distributor's business is authorized distribution, not authorized distribution and independent distribution. And if it's an OCM, you might want to know is it actually private labeled, which would make a difference in terms of maybe what you do in terms of authentication techniques. So within these three broad categories, you actually have about six categories that make some sense. The broker, where are the parts coming from? From a foreign source or from a North American source? Generality, but not an unfair one. The authorized distributor, is it from a purely authorized distributor or one with independent activity? Or from the OCM, or frankly, could we make it ourselves? There are some that toroids are a type of inductor that are often made by the end users themselves. So making this continuum, and then looking at a product continuum. Is my product life critical? Does it provide mobility? All the way down to an extra feature, and here's where you have to apply your own criteria. This is one that generally applies to military uses, but if it's not a vehicle, it may not have mobility. So you have to apply your own criteria and come up with your continuum there. But when you combine them, you can go from low to high in terms of risk, from either making yourself up to buying it from a foreign broker, or from low risk, from it's an extra feature. It's nice if it works, but if it doesn't, it's nothing bad is going to happen. Up to a life critical situation. So when we combine these two, you can come up with a grid. 
and a grid that you can then go through and say, for each type of supplier and for each type of application, I can rate it as being either low risk, and I can apply lower levels of authentication and defense, or very high risk, which I need to apply everything I've got to make sure it's a good part, a legitimate and authentic part. So, okay, that's great, right? You say, but you know what? I use the same part on my radio that I use in my missile. Now what am I going to do? Do I have to do this for every part I have? And you look at how many parts you have, and you have several thousand, and that's not going to work. Well, let's make it simple, more simple then. If we stick with the supplier continuum itself and look at that simplified version of perhaps the five to six sources, if you can distinguish on the broker of foreign source, is the broker of foreign source or is the part foreign sourced? That would be important to know. And there you would have the higher set of validation techniques, including SIM analysis or FTIR, as was being discussed, de-litting and de-encapsulating product. When you move to a broker and you know the source of the material is from North America, and we can understand and be confident in the chain of custody, then we can use a more trusted supplier approach with a more limited number of tests. When we get into the authorized distributor, if that authorized distributor also does independent distribution, what you want to make sure of is that the parts that they buy for authorized distribution are not commingled with the parts they bought for independent. They've got to run those two parts of their business separately. As a matter of fact, we recommend that your independent distribution model, even though you are, quote, unquote, an authorized distributor, what you're doing from independent distribution is be treated under AS 6081. What you do for authorized distribution can be treated under the model that we're working on now for authorized distributors. But you've got to be comfortable as a customer that they keep those two things separate and operate them separately. When you're working with an authorized distributor who does no independent work, and frankly, most of the large distributors are in that category. The name brands do very little independent work at this point. It's those that are smaller, they're trying to make a living, anything they can to survive. It doesn't mean that there may not be a separate division of a large company, but you do want to make sure that the large company's division is wholly separate in entirety. So the question is, how do I make sure that this guy's really authorized or not? The best source to look is to go back to the OCM. Their websites generally list all of their authorized distributors. And over the past several years, we as the authorized distribution channel have worked very hard to make sure that it is doing so. If you ask the authorized distributor, are you authorized, he can say yes or no. What good does that do you? Go back to the person who's doing the authorization to get your comfort level there. There is a limited risk, of course, with return materials. If you have a customer, a la the story of these Cisco routers where a company built fake Cisco routers, sent them back to Cisco, who replaced them with good ones. So there is a hole in that return process. After about the 15th return, you'd think somebody at Cisco would have said, wait a minute, that's kind of weird. But although that's not been something we've seen in electronic component distribution, you do want to make sure that their return processes are solid. Did the parts that they take back from a customer actually come from them? Were they originally from the OCM? The same thing is frankly true for the OCM because OCMs take parts back to everybody will have some channel where some product will come back to them. And of course it comes down to your, you know, to the highest risk and maybe something you decide to make yourself. The challenge, of course, is do you have the expertise to do that? Do you have machinery? That's a make or buy decision, but if it's absolutely critical, you may need to make it yourself to ensure. So a simplified version would allow you to categorize your supply base across these, I would offer six basic categories and apply different levels of mitigation requirements for those categories. That's too much. Let's just shake it down to, look, I'm going to treat independent distributors one way, authorized distributors 
in the authorized channel another, and if that's not good enough, I'll have to think about should I be making it. Some practical requirements. I do want to make sure this is very practical. When you work with an independent distribution, you do want to make sure that you have the traceability disclosure that is disclosed and available for you. The independent distributor, you want to understand their tasting capabilities. One thing we've learned over time is occasionally an independent distributor will call a test house and say, I want this tested for counterfeit. Okay, well, what kind of testing? Well, you know, just test it for counterfeit. They don't know either what to do. So make sure that you know that broker and or the test house to understand what level of testing can be done or should be done. With your authorized distributors, validate their authorization, be comfortable with their internal inspection and same for the OCMs. Thank you. Thank you.